Hey guys, welcome to yet another edition of Anoda Digital Learning. I'm so excited to have you here with me yet again. We're going to start things off with my favorite game. It's called Guess the Sound. Grab a sister, grab a brother, see if you can guess what it is. And if you think you know what it is, just say the sound out loud. Here we go. One, two, three. <laughs> Whoa, what could that be? Let's hear it again. All right, I'm just not sure. I want you to say out loud what you think it is. I'll give you three seconds wait time. All right, here we go. Let's see if you can guess what it is. It is a dolphin. And he looks like a happy dolphin, too. And I, I went with a dolphin for this one because what we're going to be talking about today can make you smile a lot. It's using words in a, in a kind of a clever and intelligent way. And today we're going to be talking about Figures of speech. How to speak intelligently. Look at that. A figure of speech is a word or phrase that has a meaning other than the literal meaning. Okay, so have you ever heard someone say, I'm so hungry I could eat a horse? Well, they can't really eat a horse, can they? Or have, they, have you ever heard someone say something like, uh, wow, that car is as big as a house? Well, hardly any car is as big as a house. So those phrases don't mean what they literally say. It can be a metaphor or a simile that's designed to further explain a concept, or it can be the repetition of alliteration or exaggeration of hyperbole, hyperbole to give further emphasis or effect. There are many different types of figures of speech in the English language, and I'm going to give you some examples of some of the most common types that are used in our language. So let's check it out. These examples of figures of speech were selected to show a variety of styles. So here we go. Alliteration. Alliteration is the repetition of the beginning sounds of neighboring words. All right, so let's see. You've heard this before. Peter Piper picked a peck of pickled peppers, and you're supposed to say it three times fast. Now, normally I would have students say this and give them some candy if they said it, but you can try to say it. Just press pause and do it now if you want. See if you're... If you have a mom there or a brother there, see if they can do it. Just press pause. And now I'm back, and I'm going to try to do it three times fast. Here we go. Peter Piper picked a peck of pickled peppers. Peter Piper picked a peck of pickled peppers. Peter Piper picked a peck of pickled peppers. All right? So I have the same beginning consonant sound in each line, right, over and over again. All right? Here's another one you've heard a lot. You can try all these on your own. Just press pause if you want to try them. Say them three times fast. It's kind of fun to do with your family she sells seashells all right by the seashore walter wondered where winnie was blue baby bonnets nick needed new notebooks that's all alliteration is all right so here's another one that doesn't get a lot of credit all right it's kind of like hidden behind metaphors and similes you never see this a lot it's called an anaphora anaphora is a technique where several phrases begin with the same word or words let's see some examples i came i saw i conquered that's from history julius caesar said that mad world mad kings mad composition that's from king john it was the best of times it was the worst of times it was the age of wisdom it was the age of foolishness with malice towards none with charity for all with firmness in the right you know he see how he's using kind of a similar phase. Abraham Lincoln said that, by the way. He's using a similar phase at the beginning. He's starting each thing with will, with the word with. Right? With firmness in the right, with malice towards none, with charity for all. And he's highlighting the American values that uh, he, he wants his nation to represent. We shall not flag or fail. We shall go on to the end. We shall never surrender. Winston Churchill. So this is during World War II when Britain was fighting Nazi Germany along. He said this to his entire nation. And you see it again. We shall. We shall. We shall. That's anaphora. Just repeating a phrase over and over. All right. Another thing is a sonnets. A sonnets is the repetition of vowel sounds and words that are close together. Here's some examples. The rain in Spain falls mainly on the plain. All right. Now, here's one with A. For the rare and radiant maiden whom the angels named Lenore. That's from Edgar Allan Poe. 
Here's an example with E. Therefore, all seasons shall be sweet to thee. Sweet E, C, the. Here's an example with I. From what I've tasted of desire, I hold with those who favor fire. Your I, your I there, I, I. Here's an example with O. Or hear old Triton blow his wreathed horn. And here's you. Uncertain rustling of each purple curtain. Poe again. Hear that U sound. All right, now here's one you hear a lot all the time. It's called a euphemism. A euphemism is a mild, indirect, or vague term substituting for a harsh, blunt, or offensive terms. So instead, the boss is going to get rid of this guy. He's going to say, I'm going to let you go. But really, he's thinking, you're fire. You see? So, like, the other day, I asked my wife if I was balding. She said, well, you're getting a little thin on top. Instead of, yeah, you're going bald, Mr. McBaldy. So, uh, you could say you're letting him go instead of firing him. You've... You could say someone has passed away, which is unfortunate, instead of died. Or you could say he was an economical with the truth instead of he, he lies all the time. Now here's another example, hyperbole. Say that word, hyperbole. And you often hear this a lot. You ever you got an uncle or somebody or a friend. I know you guys do this all the time in the hallway. I hear you do this. You exaggerate a lot to emphasize something or show an effect. All right? It's just exaggerating, which means you're, you're saying things are a lot harder than they are. Like, for instance, you guys say this all the time. If lunch is late or something and there's not enough, you know, you guys got to wait to eat. You'll say, I'm starving, which, you know, you're not really starving. You're exaggerating how hungry you are. So here's one. My backpack weighs a ton, right? No backpack really weighs a ton. All right. Or if you heard your parents say, I've told you what to do a hundred times. Now, I don't know, most of the time we haven't told you guys what to do a hundred times, but I don't know, with my kids, I think maybe I have told them what to do a hundred times. Or you could say, oh, that new PlayStation 4 costs a billion dollars. Now, it doesn't really cost a billion dollars. You're saying it might as well cost a billion dollars to me because I don't have the $600 to waste on it, which is what it costs, right? PS4, PS5. I could do this forever. That's, that's what the people at the gym say to me when I go in there and I'm like panting when I've been on the treadmill for 20 minutes and there's a guy running on it in a full incline. He's been on it for an hour. I could do this forever. Well, anyways, everybody knows that. Not really everybody knows it. So that's an example of hyperbole. It's when you exaggerate and a lot of people use that one. Now, huh, here's the one we all know and love. Irony. Irony is when there is a contrast between what is said and what is really meant or between appearance and reality. Oh, how nice, she said, when I told her I had to work all weekend. Now, was it really nice to have to work all weekend? She's being, she's using irony. She's saying it's not nice. Or a traffic cop gets sus suspended for not paying his parking tickets. That's situational irony. Or the Titanic was said to be unsinkable but sank. That's also situational irony. Or you could name a Chihuahua Brutus. Brutus is a big, strong name, like a brute, right? And a chihuahua is a little dog, so it's ironic. He's not a big dog. It's supposed to be funny. It's the opposite. Irony often says the opposite of what the message is meant to convey. It says the opposite of what you really mean. Uh, I've heard girls at Sunday school say, Oh, Claire, you look really pretty. But they don't really mean Claire looks pretty, which is mean. And I don't think any of you should do that. That's irony. You hear that a lot in America. Now, finally, we got metaphor. Metaphor compares two unlike things or idea. So you could say that somebody that knows a lot of words is a walking dictionary. Now, is she really a walking dictionary? No, she just knows a lot of words. So she's not a walking dictionary. You're comparing two unlike things. In this case, a girl with a book. All right, you could say that a man has a heart of stone. That means he doesn't have much compassion. Or you could say that time is money. Time's not really money. You're just comparing time to money. Or the world is a stage, or she is a night owl. She's not really a night owl. She's just, you're comparing her to a night owl because she stays up so much. So metaphor, emphasis, emphasis an ogre. Wow. Metaphor emphasize, it uses comparisons between two things that are different to emphasize how one of the things is like something else. For instance, she is a night owl. She stays up all night like an owl. So, guys, that is the end of our short introduction to figures of speech. You use them all the time. I hear you use these, and we're all out of time. I want you to try to use some figures of speech 
nicely in a nice way this week when you're talking to your friends and family. All right. 